Hello and welcome back to part 4 of your uh, AWS scenario based questions. So we have uh, looked at your part 1, part 2, part 3 where we have covered some very interesting uh, scenario based questions that you can expect when you are attending an interview for AWS. Now in this session we will look at some more interesting questions um, for your part 4. So the first question that we have is your organization needs to distribute content to your users who are worldwide with low latency. So which AWS service can we use to achieve this? So basically here we have data and we need to make the data uh, available to your users all, all over the world and with low latency. So what can we do? Which service can we do? Now whenever we talk about distributing your data in AWS, the service that we use is your CloudFront service. So CloudFront is your CDN service. So it's your content delivery network service and this helps you to cache your uh, data. So it's basically um, you will have an original location where your original data is available and then you'll have lots of uh, cache locations. Now these cache locations we call it as edge locations and this is where all of your data will be cached and this helps you to reduce the latency to your end user. So instead of uh, hitting the original user every time you want to access the data, your users will make use of these edge locations to uh, access your data. So AWS will use this to distribute the uh, data all across uh, worldwide so that your users can access the data with low latency. The next question we have is explain the concept of IAM roles in AWS. So when in AWS, in IAM service, we have uh, two types of um, uh, two ways that we can give access. One is your IAM users and the other we have is your IAM roles. Now IAM users are basically um, you know users that you'll be creating. So if you want to like share your account with other people, we make use of your IAM users. Now, we also have this IAM roles which can be used to give access. Now, IAM roles are your permissions which can be assumed by other services, your users or other resources. Like for example, let's say you want your uh, EC2 service to uh, talk to the S3 service. So you have some data in the S3 service. Uh, now you want to uh, access that data from your EC2 service. So your EC2 will be one service, uh, S3 will be another service. Now when you want these two uh, services to uh, uh, work together, you can make use of your IAM roles to give those necessary permissions. So likewise, uh, roles can be assumed by users. We can also use it with your other resources. Now, this gives you temporary access unlike your IAM users, uh, which are like permanent um, uh, access unless you don't delete that account from uh, IAM, you, that, that access would be there. Your uh, roles are temporary access. All right, so this helps you to improve the security and limiting the long, uh, long term access key. So under this, we don't have any credentials, unlike your IAM users, where we have credentials like your access key and secret key or passwords and all those things. With our IAM roles, it gives you the temporary access and we don't have any long term uh, uh, access keys that we generate under this. The next question that we have is your organization is concerned about uh, data privacy and uh, wants to encrypt the data that is being stored uh, before storing it in the S3 bucket. So what approach can you take? So we have S3 bucket and uh, we want to store the data in the S3 bucket. However, before we store the data in the S3 bucket, we want to encrypt that. So uh, what will be your approach? How will you do this? So for this, we can make use of your uh, client side encryption. So whatever the data that we have, we can implement a client side encryption, which will uh, encrypt the data before we upload it to the S3 bucket. So generally, when we talk about your encryption, we have this uh, uh, client side encryption as well as your server side encryption. So in this case, we can implement your client side encryption where uh, let's say if I have some data, I will encrypt it before uploading the, the data to the S3 bucket. So your client side encryption, that's basically your cryptography technique of encrypting your data on the sender's side. So whoever is sending the data, right? So the data will be encrypted on their side before it is transmitted to the server such as your cloud storage. So in this case, your S3 bucket. Now this 
will ensure that the data is encrypted before it leaves the client application so before it leaves the senders application the data will be encrypted so we can implement this the next question we have is how can you ensure that your amazon rds database remains available even in the event of a failure in the primary availability zone so here we are basically talking about how you can make your database highly available so even if something goes wrong um, with let's say uh, in one availability zone we still have the database available it, it is still accessible so how can we do that now for that we can enable your multi az deployment so whenever we are creating our database we have the option of enabling this multi az deployment now under that what happens is the database will be created in two different availability zones so we'll have so when you go to this db instances when you start creating a database let's i'll go with the uh, mysql in this case you have the option of enabling this multi az deployment now under this what happens is we'll have a primary database and we'll also have a standby database in a different availability zone so like let's say one database will be in us east 1a and then the other database will be in us east 1b now that way what happens is if even if something goes wrong with my primary availability zone i still have the database available in a different availability zone which is my standby database and i can start using this with my application now this also replicates the database so whatever the data that gets loaded to your primary availability zone the data gets replicated to your standby database as well which is running in a different availability zone and this ensures that your database is highly available in case of your primary az failure so if something goes wrong with your primary availability zone we still have the database available in a different availability zone and we can easily recover from the issue that we are having the next question we have is your organization wants to track the expenses and allocate costs accurately for different aws resources and departments how can you achieve this so here basically you want to keep a track of your cost uh, how much is being utilized uh, which resource we are spending the money and all those basically you want to keep a track of that now for this we can implement your aws cost explorer so we have this service called uh, uh, cost explorer we can use this now this gives us an information as to uh, how much we have um, uh, used the the cost like for example let's say how long we have run the ec2 instances how much is the cost and all these kind of different different reports will be available with this cost explorer and we can also use this cost cost allocation tags and this helps us to keep track of your expenses it helps you to allocate costs for different different departments or different different projects and also it helps you to generate your cost report so this has um, a built in report so if you go to this reports over here you should be able to see some of the default reports so monthly cost by service monthly cost by linked account monthly ec2 running cost daily cost so like this you'll have different different reports and if you want you can create your own report as to what information you want and this will help you to keep track of your uh, cost right the next question that we have is you have sensitive data which is stored in the s3 bucket now you want to prevent unauthorized access to this s3 bucket so what steps can you take so basically we have an s3 bucket and now you want to basically control the access to this s3 bucket so that only authorized people or only trusted people can access the data in that s3 bucket now to secure the access to your s3 bucket we have different different options we can make use of your s3 bucket policies we can make use of your im policies we can also implement your uh, server side encryption so whenever we um, like let's say if we go to the s3 service uh, one option we have is making use of your s3 bucket policy so using this s3 bucket policies we can control so if you go to this permissions we have this bucket policies which is nothing but your json document so we can define a json document as to uh, what the users can do what they can access all those can can be controlled by making use of this bucket policy and we can also enable this encryption 
So we have this server side encryption uh, that comes with your S3 service. We can make use of this to uh, protect your data. All right. So uh, we can also implement access control best practices and regularly um, audit the permissions to make sure the users have are having only the necessary permissions. The next question we have is your company needs to ensure data durability and also the availability of your critical data. So what Amazon S3 storage class should you choose? So when we talk about your S3, we have different different storage classes. You have the S3 standard, standard IA, um, intelligent tiering, one zone IA, RRS. Likewise, we have different different options. Now, based on the company's requirement, which is to make the data highly durable and highly available, which storage option A would be the right fit now for this we can make use of your s3 standard now which is the default one so by default whenever we create your s3 bucket and uh, when we are uploading your data so let me go to a bucket which has some data so here if you see by default your data gets stored in the standard so we can make use of this so amazon s3 standard offers you durability of 99.99999 which is 11 nines and this is suitable for storing any critical data that requires high availability so by default whenever we are uploading the data your data gets stored in this s3 standard so we can make use of this if you want to make your data highly available the next question we have is explain the difference between aws lambda and aws fargate for running containers now these are two different services that we have in aws now aws lambda is your serverless computing service so under this we don't manage any servers uh, we just write the code and your lambda executes your code in response to events so you know whenever something happens in your aws account could be for example, let's say you are creating an S3 bucket and whenever you create an S3 bucket, uh, you want to maybe enable encryption by default, right? So you can uh, make use of your Lambda for that. So we can write some code and whenever the S3 bucket gets created, which is an event that will trigger your Lambda function, which will execute some code for us. So that's where your AWS Lambda is. So it's a serverless computing service, which helps you to run your code in response to certain events. And then your AWS Fargate on the other hand is your container orchestration service. So we can make use of your AWS Fargate to uh, run your container. So any microservices that you wanna run, we can run that by making use of your AWS Fargate service. So this is mainly your container orchestration service. And this manages the underlying infrastructure for containerized application. So this is your uh, uh, serverless computing for running code in response to events. And this is for running your containerized applications. The next question we have is you need to distribute a private docker container image securely within your organization so what aws service can help with this so basically we want to store your container images in aws so which service can we use now in aws we have this service called ecr which is your elastic container registry we can use this to manage your images so amazon ECR, which stands for Elastic Container Registry, this allows you to securely store your images, manage your images, and also deploy your Docker container using these images, which are stored in ECR within your organization. So, you know, like for example, here, so you'll be basically creating a repository, and then by using the CLI commands, you can push those image to your, your uh, ECR, and then you can start using this to deploy your container. So this is same as your Docker Hub, which is your image repository. Likewise, your ECR is also an image repository for managing your Docker images. The next question we have is, your application uses Amazon RDS as its database backend. How can you improve the read performance of database query? So we are utilizing your Amazon RDS for the database purpose. Now, how can we improve the read performance for this particular database? Now, 
Amazon RDS, it provides us with this option called read replica. So we can implement your read replicas to improve the read query or to improve the read performance of your database. So um, whenever we talk about like, for example, let's say we go to DB instances. Uh, I don't have any database, but if you had any database under actions, you would see the option to um, create read replicas. So read replicas is what will help you to offload the read traffic from the primary database. So instead of reading and writing from the primary database, we will only write to the primary database and all the read can be done from the uh, read replica database. And this will help you to improve the read performance and also scale your read heavy workload. So all the read functionality we can do it in the read replica database and all the write can be done in the primary database and this will help you to improve the performance of your database so that's about part four of your aws scenario based questions that's all i have for this session uh, once again before you leave please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and if you like the video leave a like and please share the video